Well, noswaith, noswaith a. Good evening, everybody. Gair byr o groesos i geni ar ran y myredolaeth James Pantafedwen ac ar ran Canolfan Morlan. Fel mae'n digwydd dyma'r digwyddiad cyhoeddus cynta yn y lle yma ers dwy flynedd. Ac mae'n braf iawn mae darlith Morlan Pantafedwen sy'n dynodi dechrau cyfnod newydd ac ail gydio yn y gweithgarwch. Rwy'n dwi ddim am funud am ddibrisio gwerth Zoom. <laughs> Mi oedd nifer ohonoch chi yn bresennol yn y gynulleidfa rhithiol yn gwrando ar Linda Woodhead yn 2019. Uh, yn anffodus, mi oedd rhaid gohirio darlith Hugh Edwards y llynedd, ond mi fydd o hefo'n i gobeithio y flwyddyn nesa. Ond, er gwaitha uh, gwyrth y dechnoleg, does yn ddim byd tebyg i gynulleidfa fyw nag oes ac uh, dyna ni'n ddiolchgar iawn i bob un ohonoch chi am droi i mewn ato ni heno. Just a few words of welcome on behalf of the James Pantaf Edwin Foundation and also the Morland Centre. Since the early 1960s, we've been organising lectures such as this um, as a foundation and, and holding them in various venues across Wales. And Richard Morgan will testify to this. The list of guest speakers is second to none. Uh, but in 2015, we joined forces with Morlan. And together, we decided that we would organize the lectures from then on here at Morlan and in both Welsh and English every other year. Now, we decided against live streaming tonight but we are filming the lecture and it will be available on our respective websites uh, very soon. So I should be looking right at the camera, shouldn't I? Mi hoffwn ni ddiolch yn fawr iawn i gwenna'n crinant y sgrifennydd gweithredol Pantaf Edwen am yr holl drefniadau heno, da ni mewn dwylo diogel iawn. A diolch hefyd i'r parchedig Eivion Roberts, am i gymorth a'i gefnogaeth a'i gydweithrediad yntaf. A hefyd yn y cefna, mae'r rhaid i mi ddiolch i Stiwart a Iwan sydd wrthi yn gofalu am y dechnoleg. Diolch i chi am y cefnogaeth bob amser. Thank you, Gwenan, Eivion, Stiwart a Iwan. A rwan, mae'n bleser mawr gen i i drosglwyddo ar awennau i'r parchedig Enid Morgan. Dach chi gyd yn ni nabod i, a da ni'n hynod o falch fod Enid wedi gwella cystal er mwyn llywio y noson yma heno. It is my pleasure and privilege to hand over now to Canon Enid Morgan, who needs no introduction whatsoever. Um, but we are very, very grateful to her for agreeing to, to chair the proceedings this evening and to introduce our very eminent guest speaker, Enid Croeso i chi. Mwyn hewch yn oson. Mae'n fwraint cael cyfeirio yn y cyfarfod cyntaf yma yn y Morlan ar ôl dwy flynedd o ofyd y Covid. Mae'n arfel cael eich, chi'n gwybod, mae uh, gwerfyl wedi sôn am y darlithiau, a dwi'n am sôn yn bellach am ni. Um, many years ago, I heard um, Armando Iannucci uh, speak of being an altar boy at his Catholic church in Glasgow and how he thought he might like to be a priest. And he asked his parish priest, Father, you say that Jesus died for our sins. How does that work? He didn't get much of an answer, any more than I when I stymied my mother by demanding why the English called it Good Friday, 
which is basically the same, the same question, isn't it? Well, our speaker tonight has been criticized by groups of um, evangelical bishops uh, for not being happy with the penal substitution theory. Um, and he's never been afraid to ask awkward questions and to tackle them with wit and humor. Uh, it's a fair question for any Christian to ask. Um, and uh, Dr. Jeffrey John has been, for the last 17 years, Dean of St. Albans. He's not just a theologian, if I can put it like that, without being rude about theologians, um, but he's an exciting communicator. He can run a complicated organization with flair. And he's told me not to be too long because he wants all the time that's available. <laughs> Uh, born in Tonrevail, he studied at Oxford, <coughs> was ordained in Llandar Cathedral, and served his first curacy in Penarth. He returned to Oxford for further academic work on St. Paul and became, first of all, Dean of Divinity at Magdalen College, then Vicar of Elton, Canon Theologian in Southwark Cathedral, and eventually Dean at St. Albans. And he's now, as a run-up to retirement, become assistant chaplain at St. George's Church in Paris. Isn't that nice? <laughs> I first became of his, uh, of his work a quarter century ago as one of the founders of affirming Catholicism, a movement which in conferences and publications sought to think theologically in contemporary fashion about the Catholic tradition in the Anglican Communion. He supported the ordination of women, which is why it took my attention, and urged for the potential sanctity of same-sex relationships. Because of his honesty, he reluctantly became identified with a struggle against homophobia. And he's been named in connection with the appointments of bishops in seven dioceses. Uh, it might be that the Church of England could afford not to have him, but Wales, wallowing in the wake of the Church of England arguments, was deprived of an outstanding bishop. So, many Christian problems turn on how to interpret scripture, on hermeneutics. And that will be Dr. John's topic this evening. Croesoichi i chanerchi, gair diw, sut ma gwneud sy'n wyro honno. Rhoch Croeso i Dr. John. <laughs> uh, <Sorry>. oh, oh, <laughs> don't take my text. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much for, for your welcome and your invitation. Uh, it's really lovely to be here. Uh, Paris is nothing compared to Aberystwyth. Gwenen and Gwerdl were quite, uh, quite worried that nobody's going to turn up half an hour ago, but the number is more than respectable, so um, I assume it's a bad night on the telly, but uh, thank you for coming anyway. Word of the Lord, question mark, making the Bible make sense. Sunday by Sunday, many of us sit in churches and we hear selected bits of scripture read out at us. And that's usually okay because church lectionaries usually choose quite sensible, straightforward chunks. But there are still occasional surprises. Not long ago, I had the experience of sitting in a congregation when Numbers 15 was appointed to be read. Numbers 15, as I'm sure you will remember, <laughs> is the story of a poor little Israelite man who went out into the desert one night to collect sticks to make a fire to keep warm. Only he had forgotten it was the Sabbath, and so he got arrested by the guards. Therefore, the reader solemnly proclaimed, the guards dragged the man before Moses and Aaron, who said, this man is a Sabbath breaker. He must be put to death. Let him be stoned by the whole community outside the camp. So they took the man outside and they stoned him with stones as Moses and Aaron commanded until he was dead. This is the word of the Lord. And we all replied, thanks be to God. <laughs> the most disturbing thing was that nobody turned a hair. And worse still, when the preacher referred to the passage in his sermon, he simply took it at face value. It didn't occur to him 
even to ask in what possible sense this rather savage little story is the word of the Lord, or to question what on earth it's supposed to be telling us about God's nature. I have been in church on one occasion when somebody's conscience rebelled. In my parish in London, in Eltham, we had a splendid lady called Elsie. Elsie was a reader in church and not a woman to be trifled with. One morning, she had to get up to read the epistle at the Eucharist, and it was one of those bits of St. Paul about the subordination of women and how women must obey their husbands and learn from them at home and so on. So Elsie read the lesson dead pan in her rather posh and powerful voice. And at the end, she looked up at the congregation and said, I shall not say this is the word of the Lord, for it plainly is not. This is simply St. Paul being silly. <laughs> well, I sympathize with Elsie because it is a real question whether we should say at the end of every chunk of scripture, this is the word of the Lord, because sometimes it just doesn't make sense. The trouble with saying this is the word of the Lord after one bit of scripture is that it gives the impression we are supposed to take each and every part of the Bible as a literal, direct message from God to us now. And that is clearly wrong. Scripture is certainly the vehicle of God's word, or can be, but that's not the same as being God's word. Ultimately, for a Christian, I want to say there is only one word of the Lord, and that's Jesus, the living word. And he comes to us through the words of scripture, yes, but also through prayer and church and sacrament and conscience and reason, experience and other people. Which is why I'm unhappy about saying this is the word of the Lord after individual readings. It might be a bit truer to say that the whole Bible taken together is the word of the Lord because then at least each bit gets corrected by the perspective of the whole thing. But even then, one still needs one's reason and quite a lot of knowledge to work out what that perspective is. And the fact is, people are terribly ignorant about the Bible. At the most basic level, people still need to understand the Bible is not a book. It's 84 books, including the Apocrypha, written across the space of up to a thousand years. And across all these different books, and often within individual books, quite fundamental beliefs change. From author to author, from book to book, from verse to verse sometimes. You can move between polytheism and monotheism, between polygamy and monogamy, between the anthropomorphic God of bits of Genesis and the universal Lord of second Isaiah, between animal sacrifice and the repudiation of animal sacrifice, between tribal morality and individual morality, and between belief in afterlife and downright denial of an afterlife. Now those differences and contradictions are of course more marked in the Old Testament than the New because it covers so much more historical ground. But there are plenty of differences and contradictions in the New Testament as well as we'll see. So you can't just pick up a Bible and expect to make sense of it unless you are prepared to find out first about the background that individual texts are coming from, where is this author coming from in history, place, social setting, religious tradition? What are the relations between different authors and texts? Who has been editing whom and why? What theological or political purpose does this author have? Who is paying him? What are his biases? What axes are grinding in the background? What are the literary forms and conventions which shaped what he wrote and the way that he wrote it? 
Now, theologians use grand off-putting names for all those different kinds of investigation, form criticism and redaction criticism and genre criticism and so on. But actually, they all boil down to perfectly common sense questions which you have got to ask before you can place a passage in its context and extract its meaning. The worrying thing is that in most of what passes for Bible study in churches and in schools and in all of the Christian unions in universities that I've ever known, those questions never get asked. And if you do ask them, you're likely soon to be labeled as an unsound, unbiblical, dangerous liberal. And if you persist, you will be out on your ear. But the truth is, if you don't ask the questions, you will not make sense of the Bible at all. Because if you simply take the text at face value, not asking these things, then very often you will miss or mistake the real meaning completely. And I really just want to spend the rest of the time this evening galloping through some examples of how this works. And I also hope to show in the process of how this matter of asking the Bible questions and finding out literally where different bits of it come from, so far from undermining faith, actually enriches it and makes it far more real and far more relevant. So hopefully you've got these bits of paper, which is the, you know, the, the, the plan of campaign. And uh, that tells you where we're going. I just want to say about the different headings. So starting with number one, many Bible texts have been edited and re-edited to suit changed circumstances and new ideas and often don't make sense unless we grasp this. For example, um, I remember sitting in Tonnerreval Parish Church when I was about 14 and getting annoyed by Psalm 51 and the fact that it does not make sense. Psalm 51 is a very beautiful psalm of penitence. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, after thy great goodness, according to the multitude of thy mercies, do away mine offences, etc. And one of the main themes of the psalm is that God doesn't want animal sacrifice. He wants obedience and devotion. Thou desirest no sacrifice, else would I give it thee, but thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken, contrite heart, O God, shalt thou not despise. And we read that and we think, yep, great, that makes sense to us. Of course, God doesn't want all this blood sacrifice stuff. But then we come to the last two verses of the psalm, and the psalmist does a complete vault fast. O oh, be favourable and gracious unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem, then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, the burnt offerings and the oblations, then shall they offer young bullocks upon thine altar. And we think, hang on, he's just said God doesn't want blood sacrifice, why has he changed his mind two verses later on? It doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense. Unless you know that there are two bits of this psalm dating from quite different periods. The bulk of it comes from the exilic period, after the Babylonians had invaded Judah, destroyed the Jerusalem temple, and taken all the upper and middle class Jews off to the capital in Babylon. Since sacrifice could only be offered in the temple, obviously that put an end to animal sacrifice. So the Jews in Babylon rationalized and developed a new theology of spiritual sacrifice. And so you get Psalms 40, Psalm 50, Psalm 51, all of which teach that God does not want or like animal sacrifice. Do you think that I will eat the flesh of bulls and drink the blood of goats, says Psalm 50? If I were hungry, I would not tell you. So from our point of view, you might say that during the exile in Babylon, there was this great leap forward from the idea of blood sacrifice to spiritual sacrifice. But then there came a great leap back. A few generations later, Persian imperial policy changed. 
The Jews were allowed to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild under Ezra and Nehemiah. They rebuilt the city and the temple and the whole sacrificial business started up again. And so the last two verses of Psalm 51 were just bolted on to the rest of the psalm by a different author attempting to update it in a rather clumsy way to fit this new situation where sacrifice had come back. But as I say, unless you know that, the thing is just incoherent, even to a 14-year-old know-all in Tonareva. But that's one of countless examples. You get the same experience reading most books of the Bible. Isaiah is a good example. Isaiah has at least two and probably more authors. The original Isaiah wrote in the 8th century BC under threat from the Assyrian Empire. But then, a couple of centuries later, in the context of a similar threat from the Babylonians, somebody thought it was a good idea to update Isaiah to fit the new situation. So from chapter 40 on, we get second Isaiah. And towards the end, though this isn't quite so clear, there seems to be a third Isaiah contributing a bit from the post-exilic period. It's not that second and third Isaiah were trying to fool anybody. They probably belonged to a sort of Isaianic school of scribes who genuinely believed they were writing in the spirit of the original Isaiah to adapt his wisdom to a new crisis. Modern biblical scholarship began when German theologians in the 19th century realized that the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, could not possibly be written by Moses, but they could be assigned to various authors writing at different periods. Now, since then, various scholars have argued about what exactly the different periods were and which bits belong where. But everybody accepts that these books were written and re-edited by different people over centuries. And if you don't realize that, you will be constantly surprised by non sequiturs and contradictions. Right at the start of Genesis, we have the well-known account of God making the world in seven days in, in chapter one, culminating in the creation of man and woman. But if you read on to chapter 2, verse 4, which hardly anybody ever does, you realize that we start the thing all over again with a quite alternative creation story, in a different order with the creation of man at the start of it. Two quite different creation stories, written by different writers and different dates, have simply been shoved together. Now, how many people know that? Same thing happens in the New Testament. The Gospel of John is a good example of this because it has clearly been written by at least two authors and quite possibly by a committee. For a start, it has two endings. In chapter 20, after the resurrected Christ appears three times in Jerusalem, the chapter ends with the words, Jesus did many other signs which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that believing you may have life in his name. That's almost certainly the original ending of the gospel. It sounds like an ending. But then you turn the page and suddenly we're in chapter 21 and for no apparent reason the disciples have gone back to their old job as fishermen in Galilee and there's a different account of the resurrection as if the one in chapter 20 had never happened. Clearly, chapter 21 has been tacked on in order to include a different tradition and also to tidy up some loose ends. In particular, it allows Jesus to rehabilitate Peter. Simon, do you love me? He asks three times, clearly to cancel Peter's threefold denial. And then Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep, making it clear that despite what's happened, Peter is still the chief apostle. There's lots more uh, evidence in John of this rather clumsy sort of editing, and you can account for it in different ways. Boltman thought 
that the original John's Gospel was doctored by an ecclesiastical editor in order to make it more acceptable to the official church. Other scholars, like Oscar Kuhlman, think that there was a Johannine circle of writers, a bit like the Isaiah circle, um, which as well as editing the Gospel, went on over time to write the Revelation of John and the letters of John. That has the advantage of explaining why we have these three different bodies of material attributed to John, which are clearly very strongly linked, and yet are very different, and are clearly from different periods. They seem to be the product of this Isaiah Jahannine school working over a period of time. Number two, the Bible rarely solves problems or gives us authoritative answers on a plate. More often, we are overhearing an argument between two or more views. During the period when the New Testament was written down, the main source of division among Christians was about how Jewish this new Christian church was going to be. And you can see that the problem was there really from day one because we know that the apostles themselves quarreled about this. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul tells us that he had a stand-up row with Peter in front of the church at Antioch about this. According to Paul, Peter had at first agreed with him that Gentile converts should not be required to obey the Jewish law, but should be accepted on an equal basis. But apparently Peter had gone back on this agreement and Paul is incandescent with rage. Paul, who was good at rows, also had rows with the other apostles who were clearly insisting that the Gentiles must get circumcised and keep the food laws. So it's not surprising uh, that just as there were differences between the apostles on this issue, there are also real differences between the gospels on this issue. And especially there are differences between the Gospels of Mark and Matthew. Are you still with me, by the way? I'm very concerned that you don't go off to sleep. It's quite warm. Um, Mark, remember, is the earliest Gospel, written probably around maybe just before 70 AD, written probably for a mainly Gentile church and quite possibly in Rome, as the tradition says. It's quite, quite believable. That would be why Mark tends to explain Jewish customs, like the Corban rule or the rites of washing. Matthew was written later, and for a mainly Jewish church. And what makes the comparison interesting is that we know Matthew had Mark in front of him. He was copying Mark. Matthew, in fact, uses about 90% of Mark's material but he inserts into it five blocks of Jesus' teaching which Mark didn't have. Even the number five is probably significant, recalling Moses and the Pentateuch, because for Matthew, Jesus is very much a new Moses. Matthew also adds a beginning and an ending, the story of Jesus' birth and a resurrection story, neither of which were in Mark. So. Matthew reproduces Mark, but as well as adding to it, every so often he also changes it. And every time he changes Mark, he changes it back in the direction of Judaism and the law. In Mark chapter 7, for example, we are clearly told that Jesus declared all foods clean. But when Matthew comes to that bit, he simply leaves it out. He doesn't accept that. There was no bacon for breakfast in Matthew's church. Mark tells us that Jesus picked some corn on the Sabbath and said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Matthew didn't like that either, so he left that out too. And he also adds various legal reasons why it was okay for Jesus to pick ears of corn on the Sabbath. In Matthew, Jesus also tells the disciples to pray that the end of the world won't happen on a Sabbath, because of course on the Sabbath you were forbidden to run. It's Matthew's Jesus who says, not one jot or tittle of the law shall pass away. 
In Mark, great lumps of the law have already passed away all over the place. Now, these differences still have their impact on the church today. One good example is the difference between Mark and Matthew on the issue of marriage and divorce. In Mark, as in St. Paul, our two early writers, the teaching is very tough. Mark's Jesus, like Paul, says marriage is indissoluble. If you divorce and marry somebody else, you commit adultery, full stop. There is no second marriage. Matthew, however, as a Jewish Christian, found this impossible to accept. Judaism had always allowed divorce and remarriage from Moses on. The only issue in Judaism was how easily you could get divorced, and that depended on how you interpreted a rather obscure phrase in Deuteronomy 5. Moses said a man could divorce his wife if he found some indecency in her. And the rabbis endlessly argued about what this word indecency meant. Some argued it just meant unsuitability. So basically you could get rid of your wife if she nagged too much or she was a poor cook. Other rabbis said no, indecency only meant sexual sin and adultery was the only reason you could divorce. And that was the position that Matthew took too. So when Matthew read in Mark's gospel, Jesus said, you can't divorce your wife at all, full stop. He thought that can't be right. And so he puts an extra bit in, an escape clause. He adds, except in the case of adultery, eime epipornea. As in all the other cases, Matthew has moved Jesus' teaching back in the direction of Judaism. So in Matthew's church, unlike in Mark's or in Paul's, a Christian could divorce and marry again if it was a case of adultery. And the fact that we have two different teachings about this in the Gospels is the reason we have two different views in the church. The Eastern Orthodox Church always followed Matthew's Gospel. In the Orthodox Church, you can divorce your spouse for adultery and marry again in church up to three times. The Catholic Church in the West, on the other hand, followed Mark and Paul, and they said marriage is indissoluble under all circumstances. That's why in the Catholic Church, still, if you want to split up, you have to try and prove that your first marriage, in some sense, was not really a marriage at all, so that it's an annulment procedure rather than divorce. The Anglican Church, as ever, has tended to hover uneasily between the two. For most of the 20th century, we tried to follow the Marcan indissoluble line, but now we've moved back to the Matthean line. But really, it all goes back to that original difference embedded in the Gospels. Number three, some biblical books were written specifically to contradict other books. The books of Ruth and Jonah are good examples of this. They both claim to be ancient books, but they both date probably from around the 5th century BC, the period when the Jews were returning from Babylon under Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, the Jews came back with ne Nehemiah as the military commander, and Ezra the scribe was the religious leader. And the books named after them in the Bible describe the doings of Ezra and Nehemiah. And Ezra and Nehemiah's policy for rebuilding Judea and uh, Jerusalem was bluntly a sort of ethnic cleansing. They made a distinction between the Jews who had been in exile and those who had stayed behind in Judea. They found that the Jews who had not gone into exile had often intermarried with Gentiles, and also in their view, they were no longer observing the law properly. So Ezra and Nehemiah reacted to this by tightening up all the rules that marked out Jews from Gentiles, especially circumcision, the Sabbath, and the purity laws and the marriage laws. 
Any Jews who had married Gentile wives were ordered to divorce them, and mixed race people were excluded from the New Jerusalem. The result was that many Jews or half Jews who had stayed in Judah were driven north to Samaria, where they became the Samaritans, uh, the despised half-breed Jews that are mentioned especially in Luke's gospel. So that's the context. How does this relate to Jonah and Ruth? Well, you remember the story of Jonah, hopefully. Jonah is supposed to be a prophet who lived in the 8th century BC when Israel was overrun by Assyria. God tells Jonah to go and prophesy against the Assyrians in Nineveh, their capital. Now, even in the ancient world, the Assyrians had a reputation for barbarity. They were, in fact, particularly renowned for castrating their enemies. So it's not very surprising that Jonah was rather reluctant to go and tell the Assyrians to repent. And you remember, he takes a boat in the opposite direction. God, however, sends a storm to stop the boat moving, and when the sailors throw lots to find out whose fault it is, they discover it's Jonah. Jonah gets thrown into the sea and is swallowed up by the famous whale. After three days, the whale burps Jonah up on a beach, and surprise, surprise, he's in Nineveh, where God told him to go in the first place. So Jonah finally does what he was told. He preaches to the Assyrians in Nineveh and tells them that unless they repent of their evil ways, God will zap them and will utterly destroy them and their city. And to Jonah's utter astonishment, the Ninevites listen. And they do repent. Oh yes, they said, we've been very naughty, sorry. And all of them, from the king down, put on sackcloth and ashes, and ask the God of Israel for forgiveness, which he duly grants them. What happens next is the really significant bit, because far from being pleased with his success as a prophet, Jonah is extremely peeved. Jonah did not think that God should have mercy on these barbarians who had been plaguing and tormenting Jews for years. I knew it, he said to God. You're hopeless. How can you forgive these disgusting Gentiles? And he is so furious, he goes and sits in the desert for days on end sulking. God makes a plant to grow over him, so he gets some shade. But then God kills the plant, so Jonah gets even more furious and starts yelling against God and willing himself to die. And the punchline comes at the end. Look, Jonah, says God, you are angry with me for killing a plant, but you wanted me to kill all these people in Nineveh, 600,000 of them made in my image, not to mention the animals. Why are you so peevish and prejudiced just because I am more compassionate than you are? And that's it. That's the point of the book. Not the bit about the whale, which is the only bit anyone ever remembers, but the fact that Jonah is so narrow-minded and thinks he has a monopoly on God and that it's okay to hate Gentiles and forgets that they too are human beings made in God's image. What this author is doing is holding up Jonah as a mirror to people like Ezra and Nehemiah and saying, look, this dog in the manger, Gentile hating Jonah is you. And he's reminding them that in the Hebrew tradition, there was much more generosity and breadth before Ezra and Nehemiah came along to make it exclusive and narrow by throwing out Gentiles and mixed race Jews. Jonah is a protest book by a liberal Jew who didn't like what was happening to his religion at the hand of these zealots. And he wants to say, no, God is much bigger than you are making him out to be. And the same is true of Ruth. Ruth, you remember, is uh, a Gentile. Um, a Moabite 
who finds herself stranded in Israel after her Jewish husband dies. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, engineers Ruth into the bed of Boaz, a rich Jewish landowner. Boaz is very pleased to uh, have Ruth slip into his bed. Uh, she warms his feet, as the Hebrew euphemism goes, and pretty soon Ruth ends up as Mrs. Boaz. But in this story, too, the punchline comes at the end, where the author gives us a little genealogy. Boaz and Ruth begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David, who became the king. The whole point is that Ruth, this Gentile Ruth, was the great granny of the greatest king Israel ever had. They would never have been a King David, but for this Gentile marrying David's great grandfather. So what did Ezra and Nehemiah think they were doing, telling Jewish men they must not marry Gentile wives, and if they had, that they must divorce them if they wanted to be considered Jews? Were they better than King David? Once again, the author of Ruth is a liberal Jew protesting against Ezra and Nehemiah and against the narrowing down of a previously generous religious tradition into something mean and excluding. And that is a point, I would say, that is highly relevant to the church today. But when people read Ruth or Jonah, hardly anybody knows that that is the point. They just think about the blasted whale or the nice romantic story. They miss the point completely. Number four, some books are written pseudonymously to claim the authority of a revered religious figure for changed ideas. I've taken the pastoral examples as a good example of this, pastoral epistles rather. Uh, the pastoral epistles purport to be letters written by St. Paul to Timothy and Titus in Ephesus and Crete, respectively. But these letters are completely different from Paul's other letters in style and theological content. They were actually written to combat the Gnostic movement, which became a huge threat to the church in the second century. And one of the great dangers of Gnosticism for the church was that many of its teachings were highly compatible with what Paul himself had written. And the biggest Gnostic groups, the biggest, most threatening groups, like the Marcionites and the Valentinians, actually claimed that Paul was the source of their teaching. The Gnostics distinguished between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New. They regarded the God of the Old Testament as a sort of sub-God, who was at best incompetent and at worst malicious. So Gnostic Christians gave the Old Testament and the law no authority whatsoever. They saw creation itself, in fact, as a mistake. Gnostics were extreme dualists. Only spirit was good, because spirit, they believed, came from the real God, the Father of Jesus. Matter was the product of this inferior sub-God called the Demiurge, or the Creator. The word Gnostic comes from the Greek word for knowledge, Gnosis. The Gnostics thought that only they knew the real God, the one that Jesus came to tell us about. For them, salvation came from knowing the real God and had absolutely nothing to do with law or ethics. So it's a kind of mysticism. It's a relationship with God, a mystical relationship with God, independent of ethical action or obedience to rules. Now, St. Paul was not a Gnostic, certainly not. And yet, a surprising amount of his teaching is very compatible with the Gnostic view. Paul had also said that Jesus came to save us from the curse of the law. He taught that salvation comes not from obeying rules or from obeying the law, but from having a relationship with God through faith in Christ. Paul is a kind of mystic. That is his 
basic understanding of salvation. Paul also draws a very sharp distinction between flesh and spirit. And like the Gnostics, Paul also claimed to have a secret knowledge when he talks in 2 Corinthians about being caught up to the third heaven and being taught divine mysteries which no human being can understand or utter. Now all this made Paul and his letters very dangerous for the second century church. The second letter of St. Peter in the New Testament, which is another pseudonymous letter written against the Gnostics, actually says, beware of our brother Paul, for there are many things in his letters which are hard to understand, which the ignorant twist to their own destruction. Paul was clearly a liability who had to be rescued and sanitized in order to get him out of the hands of the Gnostics so that he could be used by the church. So the author of the pastorals makes Paul say things which Paul himself would probably never have said. He warns Timothy against the knowledge or gnosis which is falsely so called. He says that the law must still be taught and obeyed. He tells Timothy to avoid all new teachings and debates about genealogies and mysteries which were typical of Gnosticism. And he emphasizes the goodness of material creation against the Gnostics who said that material things were bad. At the same time, the pastoral letters set up a line of authority for the church to distinguish what is heretical and what is not. Timothy and Titus in Ephesus and Crete are told to ordain bishops and presbyters, and then those bishops are to ordain further presbyters and deacons so that everybody will know who has proper authority to teach in the church. And so here we get the beginnings of the threefold ministry, which became the church's main line of defense against fragmentation into Gnostic sects. All of that would have been quite foreign to Paul, but it's brought into the pastorals in order to claim Paul's authority for it. Number five. Still with me, still awake. Okay. The context is vital for fully understanding the story or the text. I want to talk a little bit about the healing miracles. In order to understand uh, the healing miracles in the Gospels, you need to remember that in Jesus' society, there was a very strict code of purity. Things were regarded as clean or unclean, kosher or non-kosher. And certain people could also be classified as clean or unclean to differing extents and for different reasons. You might be unclean because of your race, or if you did certain jobs, like being a tax collector. You were unclean if you had almost any kind of handicap, if you were lame, deaf, dumb, blind, or paralyzed, or if you had any kind of sore or skin disease or bleeding or paralysis. You were unclean if you were supposedly possessed by demons, you were unclean if you were menstruating, and you were unclean after giving birth for 40 days if you had a boy and 80 days if you had a girl. You were unclean if you were a corpse. <laughs> the thing about being unclean was that it cut you off from everybody else. It was seen as a literal contagion. If you touched anybody who was unclean, you became unclean too. So an unclean person was forbidden to touch anybody and to keep themselves hidden away for fear of spreading the contamination. Not only that, but uncleanness cut you off from God as well. According to Leviticus, God literally couldn't stand the sight of unclean, defective people. That's why you weren't allowed to enter the temple if you were lame or blind or paralyzed or a woman or a Gentile or a Samaritan. Not only did you have to put up with your disability, God didn't like you either. Scholars noticed many years ago that if you list the healing miracles, 
it seems that Jesus went around systematically healing all the different kinds of people who, according to the law, were non-kosher. A Samaritan, a Gentile, a leper, a deaf man, a blind man, a dumb man, a tax collector, a woman with a flow of blood, a demoniac, a paralytic, a corpse. He heals at least one in all the categories of the unclean. And you notice nearly every time he does the healing, he touches the person. That is, he did exactly what the law said you must not do, because touching them meant you'd become unclean yourself. But Jesus doesn't care. He touches them anyway, because he has come to say, look, these taboos don't matter anymore. All these poor people that God was supposed to hate, actually the opposite is true, says Jesus. These are, in fact, the ones God especially loves and cares about. These are the ones to whom the kingdom of heaven belongs. So the point of these miracle stories is not just that Jesus physically healed those individuals 2,000 years ago. That's marvelous enough, but it's not the point. The real point is that he's come to tear down all these taboos and barriers that kept all these people oppressed and marginalized. Take the example of the story of Jesus healing the woman with a flow of blood, a menstrual problem of some sort. The menstrual taboo in Judaism was one of the most powerful. It derived, of course, from Genesis 3, which says that God cursed Eve with the pains of childbirth for leading Adam into sin. And the rabbis argued that menstruation was a reminder of that curse. During her period, a woman was not allowed to leave her house, and if she deliberately touched a man, she could actually be stoned for defiling him. Now, this woman in the Gospel had a continuous flow of blood for 12 years, which meant for 12 years she wasn't allowed to leave the house. But now she hears about Jesus, dares to go out, she pushes through the crowd, scattering uncleanness all over the place. And finally, she dares to come up and touch the cloak of this holy rabbi. Immediately, Jesus turns around. He knows something has happened and says, who touched me? And of course, she's terrified. She's been caught out. She knows she could be killed for this. But she flings herself at his feet and begs for mercy. And then she hears the incredible liberating words, woman, your faith has healed you, go in peace. It's a fantastic, dramatic story. But the point is not just that Jesus healed this one woman 2,000 years ago. The point that really matters is that Jesus is overturning the whole taboo about menstruation which excluded and oppressed women in that society, and which in many societies still does. Like all the miracles, this story is revolutionary. Its purpose is to set people free, to include them, to give them back their dignity. And in this case, of course, it's about half the human race. The trouble is the church often doesn't grasp the implications of its own gospel. Even today, in many churches, Eastern Orthodox churches, for example, women are not allowed to receive communion during their period. And there are African churches too, including Anglican churches, where the same thing applies. But you can find the same taboo much nearer home. When we were first talking about ordaining women priests, I can remember some of my own colleagues, people I trained with, saying, of course we can't ordain women. What if they touch the altar at the wrong time of the month? Unbelievable. But they weren't, they weren't really fooling. It was there. That ancient taboo is still around. And don't forget, it's not so long ago, we stopped churching women. The old service of churching women wasn't really about thanksgiving for childbirth. That's what we turned it into now, and I say thanksgiving for childbirth. No, it was about removing the impurity of childbirth, which, according to the interpretation of Genesis 3, 
was still there. And I can remember that uh, be, be still being a taboo even in the Rhondda when I was a kid. You know, women did not go out after childbirth until they'd gone for, to be churched, whether in chapel or church. Let me give you another example. Luke tells us a story uh, about Jesus healing the servant of a centurion who was very dear to him. Um, a man called Gerd Tyson, a very sober um, New Testament scholar, has pointed out that any Jew reading that story of Jesus healing the centurion's servant would immediately have taken it to mean that the centurion and the servant were lovers. It was part of the Jewish fight back against the Greeks and the Romans to portray all foreign soldiers as gay. And a lot of the time they were. It was quite common for Roman and Greek officers when away on duty to take male lovers. Very often their domestic orderlies who sometimes became permanent partners. The Emperor Hadrian had Antinous. The Emperor Alexander had Hephaestion. Even Julius Caesar himself was known as the Queen of Bithynia because of a gay affair. They don't tell you this in Latin GCSE, do they? But I swear it's true. <laughs> that being the case, the fact that Luke chose to include this story could be very significant for gay people today. Because, as I say, these healing miracles are, in fact, theological statements about inclusion. Jesus heals and includes categories of people that Leviticus had excluded. And one of the categories that Leviticus most certainly excludes is homosexual people. So if Gerd Tyson is right, the story of the centurion's healing could be another of the same kind, Jesus including the excluded. He's come to embrace all these despised and rejected people that God was supposed to hate and include them in his kingdom. Even lepers, even menstruating women, even gay people. Number six, stories often have multiple levels of meaning, historical, theological, and symbolic. There are several stories in the Gospels about Jesus healing the blind. What do we say about them? Can we suggest to people that Jesus will cure them? I don't think many of us would dare. But if we don't, what does it leave us to say? Do we just say, Jesus did this 2,000 years ago, but it doesn't really apply to us anymore? Once again, I think we have to say that whatever history lies behind these stories, the point of them is a theological truth which applies to all of us, whether we can physically see or not. What mattered, I think, to the Gospel writers was not the physical blindness of individuals that Jesus cured. It was the spiritual blindness of us all. And actually, you can prove this from the story of Jesus healing the blind man of Bethsaida in Mark chapter 8. The blind man of Bethsaida story comes exactly halfway through Mark's gospel. If you know Mark, then you'll know it's a gospel that's written in two halves. In the first half, Jesus is gradually revealing who he is. There's a series of tremendous miracles. Jesus cures people, calms a storm, and so on. Yet the disciples are still unbelievably thick and say things like, ooh, who can this be that the wind and the sea obey him, etc. But then exactly halfway through the gospel, at Caesarea Philippi, the penny drops. Who do men say that I am, says Jesus? And finally, Peter gets there. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed. Well done, says Jesus. And immediately, now that Peter has got that bit of the truth, Jesus starts to try to teach him and the others the second bit of the truth, 
which is that this Messiah is not going to be a new King David. He's not going to be a warrior king to zap the Romans and send them back to Rome. Instead, he is going to be a humble, suffering Messiah put to death on a cross. And immediately, you remember, Peter objects, no, Lord, this must never happen to you. And Jesus straight away turns around and slaps him down. Get behind me, Satan. You think as men think, not as God thinks. And then Jesus spends the second half of Mark teaching them the second part of the truth about the necessity of humility and suffering and the cross. So the point is, halfway through the gospel, Peter gets it half right. Now it's no accident that immediately before Peter gets it half right in chapter eight, there is the story of the blind man of Bethsaida. What's the connection? What's unique about the story of the healing of the man at Bethsaida? Oh, come on. You see the connection? You know, okay. Well, it's the only healing miracle that happens in two stages. First, Jesus lays his hand on the man and the man says, um, I can see people moving, but they look like trees. And then Jesus lays his hand the second time, and we are told the man saw plainly, and he was raised up and followed Jesus. The point is that the two-stage healing of the blind man symbolizes and parallels the two-stage healing of the blindness of Peter and the disciples. What interests Mark is not so much Jesus' ability to heal the physically blind. This story is actually about Jesus' ability to heal the spiritual blindness of all of us. And frankly, I think it's irresponsible to preach on that story without pointing this out. Because unless we do, the story doesn't really relate to us. It remains a great story about something that happened long ago. But once we realize this blind man is really us, and once we start to think a bit about how blind we really are, and how half the time we only see half the truth, then it becomes very relevant to all of us. And maybe God can start opening our eyes a bit as well. Number seven. Oh, I am going on a bit. You still okay? All right. Last one. <clears throat> Some kinds of biblical literature use symbolic systems that are almost unintelligible to modern readers. Have you ever noticed that in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, Jesus does the miracle of the loaves and fishes twice? The only difference is in the number of people, loaves, fishes, and baskets of crumbs left over at the end. And these numbers clearly matter, because after the second feeding miracle in Mark, Jesus is in the boat interrogating the disciples about what they have just seen. Do you remember, Jesus says, how many people got fed the first time? 5,000. How many basketfuls of crumbs left over? 12. Okay, he says. And then the second time round, the second time we did it, how many people? 4,000. How many basketfuls left over? Seven. Right, says Jesus. See, get it? And the disciples say, nope. <laughs> and immediately Jesus starts laying into them, as he often does in Mark. How can you be so thick? Are you blind? Are you deaf? How long must I put up with you? How can I stand to be with you? What the poor disciples and most of us don't grasp is that in Jewish theology, there was a whole system of numerical symbolism called gematria. Numbers had different associations. In, the case, in this particular case, in the first miracle, the numbers are Jewish numbers. The five and the 5,000 are Jewish numbers linked to the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. The 12 stands for the 12 tribes, fairly obvious. <coughs> In the second miracle, the four and the 4,000 are Gentile numbers. Four stands for the four winds, four corners of the earth, 
and probably the four Gentile empires that overran Israel. Seven is the whole world, seven the number of completion, the completion of creation in seven days. The miraculous meal is a foretaste of the kingdom of God, which is often portrayed in the prophets as an eternal banquet, a heavenly banquet, which Jesus has now come to offer to mankind. And that heavenly banquet is offered first to Jews and then to the Gentiles. Because as Paul keeps saying, salvation is always first to Jews and then to Gentiles. So the two miracles are there as a kind of prefiguring of that two-stage offer of salvation, first to Jews, then to Gentiles, and the numbers are part of that symbolism. And you get that sort of number symbolism right through the Gospels. There are six water jugs at Cana for the rites of purification, because six was the number of imperfection, that which falls short of seven, which is completion. Or after the resurrection, when the risen Christ gives the disciples a miraculous catch of fish, we are told there are 153 of them. There's never incidental detail in the gospel. All these things always mean something. Why 153 fish in the net? Because in Gematria, 153 is a golden number. The sum of all the numbers up to 17, symbolizing, if you like, the completion of completion. When the fishers of men will have finished their catch, and hauled everybody into heaven. Just to make things even more mysterious, there's a subdivision of Gematria called Isopsephia. This depends on the fact that Hebrew and Greek letters are also numbers. They didn't have our Arabic numerals, so any Greek or Hebrew word is also a number. And this opens up huge possibilities for theological speculation. I suppose the, the best example of this in the New Testament is the number 666, the number of the beast in the book of Revelation. Uh, 666 is a doubly bad number. It's a bad number anyway, because as I said, six is the number of imperfection or the number of sin. But at the same time, by isopsephia, if you write the, the word or the words Emperor Nero in Hebrew letters, that will also give you the number 666. And it's pretty certain that Nero is the particular beastly emperor that the author of Revelation has in mind in that context. Mind you, that has not stopped people speculating for the last 2,000 years trying to prove that the great beast of Revelation is almost anybody. The Pope, Napoleon, Stalin, Hitler, even Tony Blair. <laughs> I looked on my uh, computer a couple of years ago and I discovered a marvelous American website proving that the great beast was Barack Obama. I just want to quote this, it's priceless. Note, it said, that the great beast of chapter 13 emerges from the sea. Isn't it significant that Obama was born in Honolulu in the middle of the Pacific? Honolulu has a latitude of 216 degrees, and since 216 equals 6 times 6 times 6, this is obviously the number of the beast. Furthermore, the name Barak in Gematria adds up to 36, and if you add up all the digits from 1 to 36, the result is again 666. Finally, the letters of the name Obama are all in the word abomination. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the end is upon us. The problem with apocalyptic especially is that the symbolism is so open-ended, you can make it fit almost any world events of almost any period, and then you can persuade yourself or anybody else that the end really is nigh. And sometimes that can be funny, as with that quote, but sometimes it is horribly dangerous. Don't forget the Jim Jones massacre, the Waco disaster, the mass suicide of the Solar Temple cult. All of those groups and more were created and controlled 
by leaders who were using these biblical apocalyptic texts in order to convince people that the end was here. And even when they're not so obviously deadly, there are plenty of other sects too which abuse apocalyptic in order to frighten people into conversion. And that's why it's important to understand not only about apocalyptic, but about the whole point and process of real biblical study. Religion is very powerful stuff, but it's very easily manipulated by the bad and the mad, and it's very easily changed into something oppressive and inhuman, which is why all of this stuff that I've just been banging on for an hour now needs to be far more widely known. That's it, thank you. Thank you.